another class on analysis of Boolean functions. And today we'll be talking about chapter nine of Adorno's book. And we will be introducing um, the concepts of hypercontractivity. Okay, so today's lecture is about uh, hypercontractivity. So let me share my screen here. Okay. Okay, so what is the general problem here? So let me first recall you what, uh, what we will be working on here. So recall that we define these operators T or that would take a function to another function and we define it via Fourier expansion by this formula. Okay. Um, so there is another way of, so we define this operator in these terms by a Fourier transform, but there is a, um, there is, there are two alternative definitions. Um, the first one was that if we had a rho which was between minus one and one. Well, by the way, this guy can be any sort of a complex number. We can define it this way. But if we have in this setting, we define this in another way. We define this, we could define this by another way, but just the expectation of f of y when uh, we are taking y here to be of course each each entry is iid identically and independent distributed in the probability that this guy is xi equals uh, sorry plus or minus xi equals a half plus or minus a half over whole. That's the, that's the definition. And then we did the computations and we saw that this was exactly um, uh, these operators. So this was another representation. So in particular from this, you can get a very nice inequality. In particular from this definition, you get the inequality that the moduli of this guy is less or equal than t whole of the model y at the point x. Okay. Um, and so, uh, in principle, this function here, since I didn't say anything, could be just any complex value function from the Hemi cube. So, f here just could be any, any guy. Okay, uh, but there was uh, another way. There is another way to define this operator, which is the following, which is via convolution. Okay, so let me try to explain this. Is uh, so, so. So we can uh, define convolution here as well using the product stru structure of this, of this group. Or if we identify these Hamming cube with the group of, uh, of two, uh, of, with the field of two elements, so that there is integers one, two raised to the n, we can use the additive structure here. 
Okay, these would be equivalent. And I think in our lecture one, we use define convolution using, maybe we didn't. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually define there. Okay, but you can define it here or here. So here you use multiplicative and here you use additive. So let's use the multiplicative. So if I have two functions, f and g, say, I can define the convolution between these two functions as just the, well, let me use the probabilistic approach as just the, um, say, So you do expectation in Y, where Y is uniformly distributed in the Hamming cube. And here is X times Y. And what I mean by this is coordinate wise multiplication, because this is a group under coordinate wise multiplication. Uh, so in particular, you see that this is also equal to Okay, so to be totally precise, we would have to put say minus one here, but y minus one in this group is just equal to itself. So you can just put y, but you can define convolutions in any group and in any group, the right approach is to put minus one here, but in this case, it's fine. Okay, and so if we define the kernel keyhole of x, to be uh, the product of i equals one to n of um, one plus, let's see, it's in y, i, i, and whole. If we define it in this way, then, uh, okay, and what is this? You can open this thing up and see that these are exactly the symmetric functions is a symmetric sum to so these guys here are the symmetric functions of y of course Okay, and then it's easy to see that t whole of f of x equals f convolved with k whole, k whole at the point x. Okay. Um, Um, yes, and then we'll leave that as an exercise. Okay. Uh, okay. So what's the question here we're looking for? Question. And that's the hyperconvertivity question. So let's... I give you two exponents, P and Q, and I give you Rho, which is a complex number. So I want to know when, so let's say question one, when I have this inequality, for every function, in uh, the Hamming cube complex. Uh, and so this would be the case that we'll assume that Rho is complex. Or well, the second question is, well, what happens when Q is real?
when who is real, okay? Um, so this is uh, the, the two questions. So when there is C positive such that we have one like this or two like this. Of course, this C here will have to be independent. Um, so maybe I should write this. So the question would be when there is C positive independent of F and N and the dimension such that one or maybe two holds. That's the question we're trying to investigate, okay? And in this class, maybe I will basically just make some observations about it and prove a trivial case of this inequality, okay? And, and, it will be, and it will be done for today. So the first observation I would like to make is the following. Um, we must have, so in all of these observations I will uh, say, assume say one or two. So what I mean by this is, well, there is some C independent of F, independent on the dimension, such that this inequality is true for every, oh, and perhaps I should, you should know this by now, but perhaps I should remember what's the norm P of a function, and that is just the, well, let me define in terms of expectations. That is just the expectation of modulo i of f to the power p, and then you take uh, power one, one over p after that. Okay, that's, that's the definition. Okay, so when do we have that? So we assume that one or two is true. And of course, if you, if you have a certain hole, a certain, a certain p, q, and hole such that this holds true, then this implies the same for here, but it could be the case that there is some, some uh, case where we do have this, but if I use the same hope for complex functions, then we don't. Okay. Um, so, so these things can happen, and so that's why we separate. So this is, I should say, this is called complex hyperconvertivity, and this is called real hyperconvertivity. Okay. Um, so if you assume that one and two is true, then the obvious thing happens, then you do know that this whole, no matter if it's complex or real, has to be less or equal than one, okay? Um, and, and why is that? because, um, um, well, very simple actually, because you know that T ho of some function say, so say F of X is X to the power S, then T ho of F norm, say Q, what is that? That is just ho moduli to the S and then, uh, we have X and you do norm P in X, but then this is just this guy because S is just plus or minus one. So you take the moduli of X is always one. So you just get this. This is supposed to be less or equal than some constant C times the norm of F, but again, would be just one now. So C, so if the size goes to infinity, and that will happen when we take n to infinity. 
So we can, for instance, take S equals N and this going to infinity, the constant supposed to be independent of N. And so, so that would imply that who must be less or equal than one. Otherwise it's not true. So we can always assume that who is less or equal than one. Observation two is that C, if one or two is true, then, then they are true then it is true sorry with c equals 1 and that's why it's called hypercontractivity because what is what we're saying is that well if we have this inequality okay if that holds for some constant c independent of f and independent of the dimension then that, that thing actually holds with C equals one. And that's the best you can do, of course, because T who of the function one is one. And so C must it has to be greater equal than one. And so if it holds with some constant C it actually holds with the best possible, which is C equals one. And that's why these results are called hypercontractivity because whenever you have an operator that uh, doesn't increase the norm, you call that a contractual or partial contraction, something like that. And hypercontractive means uh, the word hyper will, will come from the fact that the most interesting cases happen when Q is larger than P or larger or equal than P. And so you are actually going from, um, from some space LP to some large, some space LQ. And for instance, uh, um, if a function is L1, then it's definitely L infinity, uh, sorry, if a function is L infinity, sorry, then it's definitely L1. And so LQ, in a, by the same reason, LQ is, let me write it, LQ is contained in LP, if Q is greater than equal to P, okay? So you're going from LP, to LQ. So you're going from a larger space to a smaller space. Okay, so that's why the word hyper. Okay. So you have a, a function in, in, in some way, like you're getting a, a function which is a bit more smooth than you, the function you started with because you started with some, um, for some function which was just L1, and then you got. Um, say Q, so say P is one, then you start with a function which is just L1 and then you got a function which was uh, uh, L2 or L100. So, uh, which is better, okay. Um, and so, so y is c equals one, and that's what's called the power trick. Okay, and it's actually pretty simple. So suppose I consider the function f k of um, um, say f k of x one. Let me put it in this way x1, x2, um, xk, and that will be just a function in x1, the same function in x2, and the same function in xk, where f here is just any function from the Hamming cube, say hn to uh, say c, okay? And now fk, the function you created, is just from nk to c. Okay, so what happens now? Well, if you apply t ho in fk and you do norm q, well, what is that? That is just t ho on f 
could raise to the power k. Um, yes. No, no, sorry, not raised to the power k. T ho and f at x1, and then T ho of f of x2 just tensorizes as well. Norm q. And since these are different variables, this would be just T ho of f q raised to the power k. The same happens with fk here, norm p. This is just norm of f p to the power k. Well, but a priori we have this inequality. Because, well, it holds for any independent of the dimension. So this is less so equal than C times this, which is the same to say this. Uh, but then if you take the K root, you get this, and then you send K to infinity, because now N is fixed, but K is going to infinity. And so you send K to infinity, and you get that this is true. And so now this works in for dimension N for any function, and so there, there we go. So this is a very simple instance of the power trick. The power trick is present in a bunch of other. Uh, it's a, a nice kind of a nice thing to remember whenever you're doing this sort of a sharp inequalities and sharp estimates because when it's available, you should you should use it. Um, so let me go to observation three. Um, and that's a nice observation is that we must have, so if rho is real, okay, and then we know that has to be less or equal to one, uh, between minus one and one, then in fact, then in fact, the modulo rho is, has to be less or equal to p minus one divided by q minus one. And if rho is complex, then the more general inequality is then we must have that, okay? And then you can see that if rho was real, then you could cancel this bit with this Q here. And then you would have, um, oh no, you have to swipe. So let, let me try to do, imply, so that this implies this. So for instance, you can do, so if it, from this complex inequality, you have this, definitely. But if rho is real, this is just rho is squared. Okay. And then let's see. Um, okay, so I move this bit to this side and that bit to that side. And so what I get is what? I get two times Q minus one times rho is squared. It's less so equal than two times p minus one. These two cancel, and that is exactly this guy here. Okay. So you can deduce that guy from the complex case. Um, Great, and how do we deduce this? This is local analysis. Um, 
Why? Because, well, if one or two is true, say two is true, the complex case, uh, so one, one was the complex case, suppose the, the complex case is true, then we know it must be true with C equals one. Okay, so in the, then if it's true with C equals one, we can see what that implies. Um, and so we're going to use here the fact that when we have something like this, say for uh, say for some complex number, um, v say v some complex number then this is what? This is one plus moduli of V squared plus two times real part of V raised to Q over two. And then you can expand this as one plus Q over two um, Yes. real part of E plus uh, Q over two, so over four, Q over two minus one, and this thing is squared. And this plus O of V, uh, say moduli of V cubed, so what I'm doing is just apply Taylor expansion. So the, the binomial formula with Q over two, we can always imply, uh, apply this whenever this is like positive um, and there will be a Taylor series. And if that guy was an integer, then it will halt. And that will be ex exactly Newton's uh, binomial formula. But in any case, uh, you're just expanding, you get this, but you can also add some um, simplification because if you take the square, of this guy, you get a V to the power four. So you can put in here. And if you get the product here, you get a V cube as well. So um, yeah, so if I want to only go up to the square, I have to only go up to here. So I can, and this would be just four times real part of V squared. This four cancels with that four. And so you get only this. Okay. And so let's use that formula. So what do we get? So let me, so so again, so I'm assuming that one or two is true. And uh, I want to do, so it's true with C equals one. And then I want to do something. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, try to analyze when I, with N equals one. And when I start with the function F, which is just one plus epsilon X one. Okay, and, that, and I, will, I want to send epsilon to zero. Okay, and see what's going on. So that's what it means by local analysis. Because we know that if I put one, uh, start with function one, the inequality becomes an uh, inequality. And then when, what happens when, when you are pretty close to one, say epsilon x one. Okay. So what happens when we have this guy, that would be the norm of FP, okay? We just use that expansion. So that would be one plus P over two. Um, oh, we can further, let me further um, rearrange this. This guy would be just like Q real part of V and this bit can go to be Yes, this bit K 
can go to the other bit and then it will become just plus q over two moduli of v squared plus, so maybe I should just put something like q and then one over two, and this will be q over two minus one, e or part of e squared. So now I can erase this and just move this here, move this thing here. Okay, that's what you have. Okay, so now, so now let's now do it here. Yes, this would be P real part of, so uh, epsilon. Oh, there is no, it's just X1 plus, and then P, and then would be a one half of epsilon squared plus P over two minus one of, well, the, so this was the V. So that would be just epsilon uh, square X one squared. And then we have here P over two, then expectation of this whole thing. And then one over P. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. And then we had, sorry, some O of V cube, which is just O of epsilon cube. And then we close and then we just move this thing a little bit to the left. No, that's fine. And then this is P over two and then one over P. Okay, so I just apply, um, Now looks fine. So just apply the formula. And uh, so now we can estimate this expectation of one would be just, um, oops, just one. And then you have expectation of X one, which is zero. And then we have the expectation of the other things, which would be P over two epsilon squared. And the other thing would be just uh, P times P over two minus one epsilon squared. Um, step. Yep, and then we can further simplify this um, to say, put the epsilon here, and then this will become what? P times P over two minus P over two, I guess. Yes, so then it will be P over two times P minus one. So you can further simplify this. So P over two times P minus one squared. And then, well, you're doing expectation of O of epsilon cube will be also plus O of epsilon cube, and then one over P. Okay, and then if you do the same thing with the norm, of this guy, which would be expectation of one plus epsilon whole x one to the q one over q. Let's see what you get. You get exactly, let me just write what you get. You get more or less the same thing, but you get one plus q over two epsilon squared moduli of o squared plus Q times Q over two minus one epsilon squared real part of O squared plus O of epsilon cube. And then one over, oh. Oh, there was one more step here that, that I omitted. This is not, I don't know, this is fine. This is fine. And then you have one over Q. This is fine. Um, this is totally fine. Okay, so 
that's what we get. And, but we do know that this is true. And so that implies that um, the, well, I can take the root of one over Q of both of these guys because it would be what? Just one, and then you multiply this term by one over Q and then you get something else. And the same thing here. So that have to imply, so what you're gonna do is you're going to make the difference of these two terms, divide by epsilon square and take the limit when epsilon goes to zero. Okay, and then you're going to conclude that, um, yes, then you're going to conclude that you must have that one over two whole squared plus Q over two minus one epsilon squared V of R the whole squared must be less or equal than P over two P minus one. Oh, without epsilon. Oh, and this also divides by P, so it's just one half. Okay, that's what you will conclude, just by sending epsilon to zero. So you, again, this minus this divided by epsilon squared, send, send epsilon to zero, that has to be greater equal than zero. In the limit, you will get exactly this inequality, okay? And so not gonna bother you with the actual details. You can rearrange. Did I stop? Well, there, there may be like a, a break or a problem in the video some minutes ago or some seconds ago, but that's what we get in the end. And again, you just send epsilon to zero by doing the difference of these two terms and dividing by epsilon squared and send epsilon to zero, you get this inequality. And then by rearranging, what you get, you get, um, you get this, you get that the real part of minus the real part of P minus two, minus Q minus two, who is squared is less or equal than P minus Q more. Yeah. So you get more or less what we claimed for, uh, which was this, uh, but not exactly, but we got just the real, minus the real part of this thing. Okay, and then the trick is repeat everything, and I will leave as an exercise, uh, with epsilon replaced by epsilon V, where V is just any complex number of norm one. Okay, so you re repeat everything, what you will get is that um, uh, the same thing, but then multiplied by V squared. Okay, and then we leave that as an exercise. But then what happens is that when you do like V squared now can be again, another uh, like arbitrary vector of norm one. And when you take the product of two vectors and take the real part of it, what you do is basically is just the inner product of this guy with this guy seeing as vectors in R2, or maybe the inner product of the, let's say, uh, 19, uh, 19 ro uh, degree rotation of this guy or something like that. So it's not hard to realize that the supremum of this left-hand side over all vectors V is exactly the norm of this thing. So then you take the soup in V of norm one, and then you get exactly this.
Okay. Which is what we wanted to show. So the NOCO analysis tells you that you must have this. And what we're going to show, and this was only recently established, not yet not fully because the paper is not published, but what was, and this was completed, was in part the breakthrough of, of Weisler. Uh, and then there is a recent paper of Nazarov and Ivaninsky that complete the proof of showing that this local condition is actually sufficient to derive this inequality here with, again, C equals one, because if it holds with some C, it holds with one, okay? So we deduce that if this is true, we must have that just by a local analysis. And um, what they, these two papers, like uh, this old paper and this recent paper, they complete all the cases showing that, uh, and we will see that in more uh, details. Oh, I see. And we see that in more details that this, this condition is actually sufficient to recover that inequality. Okay, so this is. Okay, so the other reservation we'd like to make for is about the case P equals Q. Okay, so and whole real. That is, then we know that we must restrict to whole less equal between one, minus one and one. Um, oh, so we, we just deduced that whole in model I needs to be less or equal than this. But if P equals Q, that's equal to one, okay? So that's the most, and so far, any hole could be between one, minus one and one. And um, this is actually something easy to show because of the, then that case we will prove now. So we will prove that that case is true because we know that we can write this as convolution as this kernel. And there is something called uh, Young's inequality. Maybe right here. And that actually is a very general inequality. It works for convolutions defined in arbitrary groups and etc. That if you want to compute the LR norm, and that could be some group, but in our context, it's just what we know that is always less or equal than, let me put all the letters here, so I'm trying to compute, let's say C and then A. And then B, as long as one, all these numbers are less or equal than, greater or equal than one, and less or equal than infinity. And we have the relation we have this relation. So Young's inequality tells you, tells you that this is always true. And a nice particular case is that in particular, if I want to do the same norm as F, so if I put A here, I have to put B equals one. And that would attend this inequality because if C equals A, then B has to be one. And so we have this inequality. So, so in particular, this norm P is less so equal than this norm P and this norm one. Okay, but what, what is this norm one? Let me remember what this kernel is. This kernel was just uh, the product i equals one to n of one plus whole x y i. Okay, 
So if I do norm this and do expectation in Y, this is equal to the product of the expectations because these are independent. So, and all these expectations are the same. So this is nothing but uh, this plus this, a half, a half raised to the power n. And ho is the last, so it's between minus one and one. So this whole thing here inside is just one. Okay, if ho was complex, then this would be definitely uh, 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 not one. So it would be um, greater than one. Um, and so, uh, so, so in any case, we are dealing with a real case. So hope Young's inequality shows that then this is just less or equal. This is just equal to model Y. Okay. Okay. And so, um, so this is true. So if Q was less than P, then we do know that this is always true because of the answers inequality, the norms, the spaces are concatenated and norm is increasing with the exponent. And by what we just showed, this is less or equal than P. And so done, okay? And this holds for every whole less or equal than one, between minus one and one. So the case Q less than P is trivial, okay? Because this is Jensen and this is Young. Okay. And so is trivial. So that's why we usually we restrict our attention to this case. Okay. Okay. Okay, let me just give a quick proof of Young's inequality and let, and then I have another um, So I'm gonna do the case C equals A, but you can easily adapt the proof for the other cases. So I wanna show that, I wanna show this. And for the other cases, you can adapt this proof very easily. For the case where you don't have C equals A, then it's easy to adapt, okay? Um, so how can we do that? I think what you wanna do here is the following. So what is, um, yes, so what is F convolved with X, with G at the point X norm P, or norm A, sorry. Well, we have to compute the norm so let uh, a prime be the dual exponent. That is a prime is one plus a prime plus one over a equals one. Well, this guy is the supreme of all functions h with a prime norm equals one of the inner product with h. Okay, which is, as we know, the expectation of F convolution times H C H bar. Okay. Um, so, so, so then this is the quantity we want to measure. 
But what is this? So this, this is a double expectation. So say one is in X on that side, and then we have some expectation in Y, and the first would be what? This would be Y, G, X, Y, and this guy will be in X. Okay, and this is supposed to be the model I here, which is the model I of this thing. So what's the model I of this thing, which is the model I of this? Um, and then what you do, well, you split, well, first of all, let me just simplify and put things like the model I inside and everything. Okay, and then what you do is the following. You write, you write what? You write here f of y to the power p, model i of g of x, y, and then you raise this to one over, not to the p, to the a, one over a, and then you do the same here and you, you, yes, you do G, um, yes, X, Y, model I, and then H, X, model I, and then you rate, oh, to the power what? Uh, a prime, and then you raise to one over A prime. And then you Finish. So let's see if we just still have the same thing. So this was to be f after multiply by this, and this would still be h after multiply by this, and the g would be one over a plus one over a prime, which is one because we took the dual exponent. So now we apply holders. So this is holders inequality for three functions. Um, is it for three functions? Is it just for two functions? No, it's actually just for two functions. I guess in the general case, when you have the C, then it has to be for three functions. But then here's just for two functions. Just apply LP norm here, LA norm here, and LA prime norm here. So this would be less or equal than the expectation in X and Y of the LA norm here which you conveniently just get this. And then one over A, yes. And then the expectation of G of X, Y, L, A prime norm, and then H, X, A prime, one over A prime, okay? But then I use note that what well, this expectation is in X and Y, if I'm doing X first, well, doing an X is the same as uh, without this Y here, because this is a group and then I, I can just, and the measure like is invariant under application of elements on the group, okay? So if I vary over all X with Y fixed, I'm varying over all the points in the hand group. So this is equal. So that means that another way of saying is that the variable x y and the uh, variable x y are actually uh, independent. So this expectation just splits. And what is that? Well, that is just the expectation of the model i of g raised to one over a. And on the other hand side, you get exactly the same thing. Be raised to one over a prime, then you can put all these things together, and that is just f a h a prime, but h a prime is one. And these two add up together the expectation of g model i, which is just the norm one. And so since this is less or equal than this for any function h it puts by this dual realization of the norm LA norm, you get the result. 
Okay. So now this just follows from holders inequality for two functions. It's supposed to be two. And I guess the general case follows for, from holders inequality for three functions, actually. You have to do the similar tricks just to think about the correct decomposition here. And this is the proof you see in Wikipedia, by the way. So you can just go there if you can't do it. Okay, so the final observation is the following. That will be what observation five is that if Q is greater or equal than P and you have this, so this could be complex, say. We don't care, or real. It works in both ways. If Q is greater or equal than P, and you have this uh, for all f um just H one, say, then you have this same thing. For all f from h n to c, so that is going from n to n plus one. Say now it should be like one to all n. So in a way, the macro phenomena, which is the the thing that happens for every dimension, is implied by a. Uh, a, a very fundamental and simple law, say, barring this, these uh, heuristics from physics, say. Uh, if you have just inequality that works for one, then you can extrapolate and you have something that works for every, for the same constant one, okay? And this is actually pretty easy to show because, well, if I have some F here, say, say complex, for instance, then I can write T ho of F as say T ho only applied in the first variable and then T ho applied in all variables from two to N. And this is a, say a tensor product. Because, well, the operator T-ho acts exactly as a tensor when you go to n dimensions. You just apply to the first variable blindly, then you apply to the second variable blindly, pretending that the orders are fixed and so on, and then you get the operator again, okay? This is simply because T-ho of x to the s is simply uh, um, uh, T-ho applied to, say, xi product of i equals uh, belonging to s. That's very, because it has to multiply that thing by ho to the power s, and it will multiply all these guys by ho. So it's acting like a tensor product. So that, that's why we can do this splitting. And therefore we can do, if you do the expectation of t ho of f say x1 up to xn. Um, and then this is just raised to the power q one over q. So you can just rewrite that as t who in the first variable uh, applied to a tensor t ho and variables greater or equal than two, say, um, of f. But then what is this? This is just t ho applied to. I 
then this would be just some function g, say, of the other variable, say, x2 to xn, that you apply, and it depends on x1, of course, and then you apply, and then it gets you something that depends on x1. Okay, so now this is just a one dimensional thing. I mean, if once I fix these guys, I just have a one dimensional thing. So I, then I can apply the inequality. I can say that this is less or equal than to um, oh no. Okay, so I have to it's not 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 too fast, of course. This is what expectation. So I could do this expectation first, say in x1, and then I do in the rest, x, j, j greater than equal than two. Okay, so I will do an expectation of an expectation. So I have to do this. One over q. So I didn't do anything so far. And now I leave the x, j, j greater equal than two on the outside and apply the one dimensional inequality inside. And then on the outside, I have just, um, Oh, then I have to raise this to the Q over P because this was only this thing inside here uh, was without the one over Q. So to apply the one dimension inequality, I have to raise both sides to the power Q. Okay, so that's why you have this extra Q here. And then we have one over Q. And then what you apply is Minkowski inequality, which I will state in a moment, which allows you to flip the outside norm with the inside norm. And this only works because Q is greater or equal than P. And so you get expectation on the outside X1 and that you do norm one over P and you take expectation of XJ for J greater or equal than two of the inside function. XN, X1, and then this is P and this is one over, oh, this is Q, and this is one over Q. Okay. And so now, but what is this function G? Well, now this function G is just, well, whatever it was here. So that is exactly just T who applied to the variables greater or equal than two at the function F. Uh, when the variable x1 is fixed and you're looking at only uh, the other variables. Okay. So the internal function that depends on x1, for each x1, you fix x1 and apply the operator whole in the, the remaining variables, and that's the operator you get. Okay, so you can inductively continue to do that. And so you remove each variable one by one. And so in the end, what you get is exactly just the expectation over X of just the function F, X to the P one over P. And that's it, that, that proves the, the inequality. So what we used here was Mikomsky inequality, and that works for Q greater or equal than P only. And it basically says that this works in any measure space. Uh, So yeah, this, this was bad. Uh, so if I start with, let me write, it was not a good idea to write here. Let me write here. So if I start with the function, 
and now first do norm uh, p in the variable x, and then do norm q in the variable y, that is less or equal than first doing norm q in the variable y, and then doing norm p in the variable x. Okay, that's Minkowski inequality. And this works like, this could be any measure space like we have here, and this could be any function as long as both sides, as, I mean, this works, whatever, as long as the function is measured. Uh, and do I have a proof for you? Um, yes, and I guess the proof, the proof for Q equals bigger than P just follows, follow, follows easily from um, the proof with p equals one, okay? And then for p equals one, the inequality is just like the integral of f of x, y, say with some measure in the variable x, and you do some norm. Let me just write dx, but dx could be like a measure, whatever, whatever it is. And then you do the norm q and y, this is just less or equal than the integral of the norms, the Q norms in Y and DX. And this is just an instance of a triangle inequality, you say, because, well, these guys are basically, I mean, if you interpret this sum as, this integral as a sum, so what you're doing is just saying that, and then the most basic case would be just the sum of two terms, then basically you're saying that if you have two functions, then this is true. Okay. And so you can put a bunch of functions instead, a sum, and you can take that sum to infinity. Say you have a continuous sum, which is an integral. And so an integral. And so you get this inequality. So it's not hard to prove that, okay? And this I will leave as an exercise. So it's a pseudo proof here, uh, but you can believe. And the case, and, and then go from p equals one to any p is actually simple. You, you, I mean, you, you're just integrating a function raised to the power p instead. And instead of having LQ norm, you have, you can rewrite that as LQ over p norm. And since Q is bigger than P, that's bigger than one. So you can still use uh, this inequality here. Um, so it's also easy to show. And that's all I have for today. And the next uh, class, we will talk about applications of hyperconductivity and some particular case and, and similar inequalities. And then in the following lectures, we will actually try to prove this thing, okay? And so thank you, see you next time.